continuing our summer speaker series, and I'm very pleased and happy to invite up Mel Epstein to talk to us this evening. Shabbat Shalom. Before I uh, came, I was telling you, in front of me this weekend, I went to uh, baseball games. My 13-year-old grandson was playing. And I noticed the kids got along fine, it was the adults that were the problem. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, at a 13-year-old baseball game, if the adults can't get along, the chances of world peace just aren't going to happen. But it was just a real insight. My name is Mal Epstein. I'm a native of Omaha. Went to Central High School, went to the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and graduated from there. My wife, Lois, was a native, went to Central High School, and was a UNO graduate as well. She died in 2009. Lois's favorite color was orange. When I was about to retire, Lois asked me what I was going to do when I retired. I said, well, you know, I, I'm so ignorant in religion in general, and Judaism in particular, I think I need to study. And of course she said, well, why do you have to wait till you retire? And so I began to study. During my growing up days, when I was at UNO, it was also during the Vietnam conflict. It was not a war, it was a conflict. As I was going to be a business major, the Air Force, of course, made me a medic. <laughs> and I served at the base hospital out here at off Air Force Base and we got an honorable discharge as a staff sergeant as a, uh, as a, a specialist, I think was the right word. I have three daughters, Randy, Robin, and Ricky. I have eight grandchildren, four boys, four girls. Two of my daughters, five of my grandchildren, live in St. Louis. One daughter and three grandchildren live in Denver. I have one brother who lives in Harlingen, Texas. And if you don't know where Harlingen is, it's about uh, the difference between Harlingen and the Mexican border is the difference between Omaha and Council Bluffs. <laughs> I became a temple member in 1975 was active in the Brotherhood, which was very active at the time. Lois became very active in Sisterhood, which was also very active at the time. I was on the board of directors, as I see some of the members out here. I was scheduled to become president in 1988. However, there was turmoil within the congregation, which is not unusual. <laughs> and the president before me resigned Abruptly, I became president in 1987. And when I was asked to talk tonight, I thought, gee, what can I say? And I can't say much. These were difficult times that all synagogues go through. Uh, the end result was that I was involved in the hiring of RA, which was a very good outcome for the synagogue. When I was past president at that time, they did, with all the past presidents, they put us on the cemetery committee. <laughs> and I became a cemetery co-chairperson. During my time at Temple, when I was active in the, uh, in the board, two things came to mind which I thought I could share with the congregation. One was a trip to Scott's Bluff with Rabbi Brooks. I often wondered what the rabbis did with their discretionary funds, and what Rabbi Brooks did is he got involved in community affairs. In Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, there are no Jews. If they are, they're not there very often. And we were invited to speak to a Catholic church. And Rabbi Brooks and I flew out, and we spoke to the Catholic church. I spoke as the president of the congregation. He obviously spoke as the rabbi. And I was amazed because before we spoke, the priest got up and said the youth group was having a spaghetti dinner and asked everybody to come. The roof had sprung a leak and they needed to raise some money and remind everybody that they should come more often. The other thing that I remember that I could share 
Because when I was president, Bethel was building their new building. And this is something that all presidents go through. And I thought it would be very nice if Temple made a donation to Bethel. So I made a donation, not a huge donation. And it was over there, and of course it was in the Jewish press because all the donations showed up. And when I got home that night, the phone rang, and I picked up the phone, and it was one of the congregants who thought it was just wonderful. It was something to show unity, that we could work together, and that Temple should do it all the time. And in those days, I don't know if you remember, you could hang up, and the phone would ring instantly again. I no sooner hung up that call when I picked up the phone again, and there was another congregant who informed me that when he gave money to Temple, he did not want it to go to Bethel. <laughs> and that if he wanted to give money to Bethel, he would have sent it there. <laughs> and I realized that was nothing more than being the president. So for the current president and past presidents, I'm sure we all have stories like that that we can tell. But those are the two that I could share with the congregation. And now, so as to keep it in the spirit as to why I'm here, why do I study religion? Well, other than the fact that I'm retired, I wanted to. And I asked Candor if she would read from page 33 of your prayer book, there's a prayer book, where it talks about struggling with what goes on with the Torah. And when I decided to study religion and struggle with it, I picked the three that Temple had been involved in and that many of the speakers had talked about. But I added one other religion because most of the speakers talk about the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I also put down the religion of our Native Americans, which is getting very difficult to study because they've all been converted to Christianity. And while all religions have three common themes, which are the ethics, which are very common among them all, the rituals and customs, which are very different, and the beliefs, which are very different. The one thing I noticed about the Native Americans, their hero, their representative of their great spirit, unlike any of the Abrahamic religions, was a woman. And she is the one that brought peace and understanding, gave birth to the world. And I thought that really went over very good in the Abrahamic religions, but for the Native Americans, it was a woman. And I'm talking about the Lakota tribe, because there are many different tribes within the Native Americans. But for the Lakotas, it was a woman. And I found that very interesting. I mentioned that I struggle with my study of religion, and so do many of the speakers we've had here at the temple. The original one that got me thinking that I would like to learn more, and I'm not going to name the religion, like Toluska was here, and obviously he talked about it, but the one that really struck me was whether or not organized religion has done more harm or good over the centuries. And as more I study, the more I'm convinced that there is no answer to that. I, I don't believe that there is. But there is a lot of things where there are no answers. When I've been studying, the Orthodox say that the future of Judaism is only if we go back to the ways of the Torah and follow it explicitly. Reformed Jews say the only way Judaism is going to survive is if we change and we understand Torah and bring it to where we are today. And again, I think both could be correct. One of the more interesting speakers we had was one that talked about true believers. And I thought, wow, that's wonderful. We all want to be true believers. And he went on to explain that's very dangerous. Because true believers are the ones that strap bombs along themselves in the name of religion. True believers are the ones that can't get along with anyone else. Believers, which is what I put myself in, are those that follow what they believe are the tenets of the faith. So I'm a believer. I'm not a true believer. I believe there is room for others. It brought me in my studies to a book that I'm surprised we don't do here at Temple called Nathan the Wise. And I don't know if you people are familiar with Nathan the Wise. The author was Lessing. It was a German play in 1779. And it's the first written, I guess, documentation trying to get along among the religions. The, the idea behind Nathan the Wise 
was going to bridge the gap between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And the major theme was friendship, tolerance, relativity of the, re the relativity of God, and the need for communication. The play ran one week and was banned by the church because it dared to suggest that all three religions might be equal. And the ban lasted as long as the author Lessing was alive. We had the Orthodox gay rabbi come, and he talked, and not that it matters a whole lot, but I didn't buy a lot of what he had to say. And the more I thought about what he had to say, the more I realized that all religions sort of use the same basis. And that's that in the translation and in the interpretation, there is always misunderstanding and room to argue, to talk, and to try to understand what we're trying to get out of the Torah and the other books that are, that are holy to other religions. For lay folks, which is where I am, and also a very ignorant late folk. There is a great book I read by a man by the name of Bart Erlman, and it's called Misquoting Jesus. And it goes into a great detail about translation and interpretation. I think believe he's an Episcopalian preacher, and for him to write his book, he learned Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And he went back to source materials and trying to translate these into English. And I thought it was an excellent <coughs> book, and it went on again to this translation and interpretation, and how it can be misunderstood, and how that misunderstanding can be used against us as a people. It, it's just amazing. Uh, and, you know, when you read about Cain and Abel, which is one of the very early murders, you know, there's the curse of Cain, and as Cain, I believe and agree, there is no real definition as to what is the curse of Cain. Well, the Ku Klux Klan said they knew what the answer was. The curse is that you were black. And so that's how interpretations from the Bible can be used against us. One of my favorite studies is from a man by the name of John Strong, and he was a speaker here at Temple. So it isn't just me that wants to study. I think it's Temple that wants us to study. I don't know if Temple wants us to struggle, but certainly it's in our prayer book, and I struggle. John Sprawl, to me, was the best to determine why there are biblical misconceptions. And I'm just going to share these, and then I'll be quiet. I don't know what my eight minutes is over. <laughs> Three misconceptions. First. People assume the Bible accurately reflects history, which is in no way true, and no biblical scholar ever says that. From the time Abraham lived, which he is the father of the Jewish people, to the very first stories in the Torah was 900 years. And I don't think there's anybody that would say over 900 years that oral translation wouldn't have been changed but yet we accept it as being a historical truth. Moses, who we're talking about a lot on our Torah study, who was the genius who put a stamp on our testament, died 300 years before the very first story of Moses was written down. Now i got to ask you over three years if you have a hero, if he doesn't get better, if everything he does isn't more miraculous, <laughs> Come on, it's 300 years that it was a verbal translation. However, it isn't just Judaism, and just so that I, I'm fair, Jesus of Nazareth, who we all know about, lived between 4 B.C. and 30 A.D. Yet, everything written about him was done from the years of 70 to 100 B.C., or 40 to 70 years after he died. Plus, they're all written in Greek, a language Jesus never spoke, nor read, nor could write. So is there room for disagreement among religions? Absolutely. <coughs> Second major misconception is distorting the Bible to fit your needs. Uh, you know, we're going to read about 
the God we pray to. And yet, if you read the Torah, it's a very, it's not very nice. There's a lot of things that cause problems for a lot of people that study Judaism. However, to be fair, there's a lot of things in the New Testament that bother Christians. And in the Koran, there are a lot of things that bother Muslims. So I continue to study. I continue to struggle. I can trick.